Praise boss when morning work bells chime. Praise him for bits of overtime. Praise him whose wars we love to fight. Praise him fat leech and parasite. Is it water with the sheep in the in the box? The fact that this video exists at all is probably surprising to many of you, partly because it's the third video in a series I've made, other than the Star Wars ones I did, in which I deleted the third video, ah, uh, the irony, because I have somewhat of a tendency to make two videos in a series and then just sort of leave it at that, forgetting them for months at a time, but also because I do have an old video which discusses how Marxist theory applies to many modern and especially office jobs, using call centres as a case study, so this video therefore must seem a little obsolete. Right? Well, don't get me wrong, I will be briefly reiterating a couple of points I made in that video, but this is by no means just a rehash of the second video I ever made on here. The reason this video exists is quite simply that whilst capitalism can, and in many cases does, make individual jobs and people's working lives fucking miserable, and that is, of course, absolutely worth discussing, today I'm going to discuss work more as a concept, as an idea, and take a look at the broader implications of work under capitalism. Here's what we'll be discussing today. 1. What is work and why do we need it? Two. The profit motive versus the public good. 3. Growth versus sustainability. 4. Ownership of the means of production, alienation and hierarchy. 5. Productivity and work-life balance. So, let's spend a while complaining about capitalism on the internet using a platform owned by a corporation with a net worth of almost a hundred billion dollars, shall we? <laughs> This mostly seems like a no-brainer, and to an extent it probably is, but I think it's pretty relevant context, so I'd appreciate it if you'd humour me briefly. For argument's sake, here is the dictionary definition for work. Be engaged in physical or mental activity in order to achieve a result. Do work. Of course, absent is the purpose. To achieve a result is a pretty vague phrase, so why do we work? Well, that's a whole section I'll get into in a moment, but for now, perhaps it might be better to ask, why does work need to get done? This is a much easier question to answer, and it's actually actually relatively simple. Work is carried out in order to produce or provide a product or service desired or needed by a person, group or society at large, for which the worker is usually compensated with funds which they can then use to obtain or access products or services they desire or need, and so on and so forth, extrapolated outwards across all of society. The system works! Or at least that's how it's supposed to work, in a perfect capitalist world as described in PragerU videos about how flower shops provide the best possible service, because capitalism, corruption and exploitation have nothing to do with one another, but like much of capitalist thinking and philosophy, this scenario is unrealistically utopian, as has been repeatedly proven by the repeated failures of various capitalist regimes across the world, established by essentially well-meaning but incredibly misguided people throughout history, it's incredibly clear that capitalism is a nice idea in theory, but in practice it's never worked, and in fact usually inevitably results in a few powerful corrupt people at the top of society hoarding all the wealth and power whilst the poor starve and die in the hundreds of millions, after having been lied to about creating a more just and equal society. The simple fact of the matter is that under a capitalist system, regardless of any idealised concept of what the media, politicians or capitalist propaganda might say, the purpose of work, at least for the worker, is simply to, well, not die. Because, make no mistake, corporate-aligned governments, which in a system that actively requires massive amounts of corporate funding to survive is a majority of them, will ensure that existing without working for a boss or corporation is functionally impossible. We can see this in the UK, most obviously. Over the past ten years, the Conservative government, which is mostly funded by billionaires and corporate interests and backed up by Rupert Murdoch's media empire, has slashed funding for homeless and disability services, deliberately set mandates on the Department of Work and Pensions, pushing people who can't work at all into a situation situation where they have no choice to either work or die, and of course inevitably thousands of vulnerable and disabled people have died as a result. This is not just random cruelty, I very much doubt that Boris Johnson cares about helping the poor, but I also don't think that he's actively trying to murder them. No, this is calculated. What they're doing is creating a situation in which the disabled and unemployed are incapable of surviving without work, even if they physically can't work. There have been people with no arms and legs being declared fit for work, and families relying on food banks to avoid starvation simply because they couldn't afford enough food to feed their kids after having been out of work for whatever reason. The threat is clear and the motive is barely hidden, as thousands die of preventable means, disabled people declared fit for work commit suicide rather than be a burden to their families, children are malnourished in one of the richest countries on the planet, and Theresa May, Prime Minister until just a few months ago, repeatedly said shit like, the best way out of poverty is into work. We have a welfare system that provides support to those who need it, and a welfare system that 
that increasingly encourages those who can to get into the workplace because we continue to believe that work is the best route out of poverty. The government, backed by corporate money, give their paymasters massive tax breaks while simultaneously making a simple, implicit threat to the poor. You will work. You will sell yourselves to our corporate masters, yoke yourself to the wheel, chain yourself to an impressive, malicious money-making machine, submit to being ground up in the cogs of capital, or you will suffer and die. If you can't work, you're worthless, so go on and die. The cruelty is not an end point. It's a fringe benefit and also a means to an end. A threat of sorts. You cannot be out of work, even if realistically you should be, because if you are, you'll be unable to feed your kids, probably kicked out of your house if you rent, because it takes about six weeks to process a universal credit claim, and most landlords take rent in monthly instalments, and due to cuts to homeless services, you won't even be able to get help there either. The only way out is to allow yourself to be exploited by the people who really run the world, and even then, a lot of people are in work and still in poverty exacerbated by figures like this Tory candidate who genuinely believes that people with learning difficulties shouldn't be paid the same wage as neurotypical people. You shared uh, an article on your Facebook page saying that disabled people could work for less than the minimum wage. Uh, would you care to defend that? Did you read the article? Yes. You read the article and it was about people with um, learning difficulties? About them being given the opportunity to work because it's to do with the, the happiness they have about working and the obsession about looking. It's about learning difficulties. It's about having... How patronising! How dare which incidentally includes me. My learning difficulty is incredibly mild and most of the time it doesn't really affect me in massive ways, although it does affect me a little bit at work. But I still have a life. I still need to pay my rent and my bills. I'm not lesser than other people. I'm not worth less. Maybe get another job. Yeah, give literally your entire life to us, peasant. It's either that or we'll kill your fucking kids. That is work under capitalism. A process of coercion force and exploitation. And there's no escape. You can't just get away from capitalism and go live in the woods somewhere and LARP as an anarcho-primitivist, because land ownership is such that it's illegal for you to go just live off the land like a Neanderthal, at least in most western countries, especially smaller ones like the UK. Seriously, go into the wilderness and live as a hunter-gatherer if you want, just see what happens. After a certain amount of time, you will be arrested and brought back to society, because that land, most of the time, is owned by someone, even if there's nothing and no one on it. You can't just exist on someone else's property. The commons don't exist anymore, buddy. You can watch as many primitive technology videos as you like, but the guy who makes those owns the land he makes those videos on. He's not just some hobo living in the woods. He's a relatively well-off landowner, pretending to be a caveman. And unless you have the kind of money to buy a ton of green belt land, that's not much of an option either. So, what should the purpose of work be? <laughs> If you've been online in any leftist spaces, you've probably seen this image floating around, and that's pretty much what we're going to be talking about in this section. Work not as fulfilling a need, as capitalists like to pretend it is, but a method of providing profit, regardless of whether or not that work fulfills an essential purpose or benefit to society. Society does not need Garfield Eats. No one is in any way begging for people to cold call them, to try and flog them dodgy solar panels. And yet, these jobs exist. Whilst actual public needs, like nurses and carers, which often have their recruitment budgets and wages slashed under corporate controlled governments are not incentivized or attempted to be filled at all, unless part of an election promise that was shown to be a lie pretty much immediately. And why is this? Well, but simply because under our current system, work exists not to provide essential services for people in society, but to provide profits for shareholders and billionaires. Think about it, how many bullshit, pointless jobs have you had? For me, it's been most of them. That's, what, six years of my working life dedicated to some fucking inane bullshit to enable the smooth running of a company selling the exact same product as 12 other companies or actively making life difficult for the average person. And all that time, I could have been doing something to help people, enriching society in some way, but the problem is is that not only are those jobs incredibly rare and hard to come by and rarely, if ever, pay a decent enough wage to live on, but one person can rarely ever enact such massive changes. That kind of power can only be wielded by those with capital, and usually they seem rather reticent to spend money, even public money, on improving society, preferring instead to spend it on tax cuts for their super rich mates and maintaining a nuclear arsenal that will never get used. Or at least if it does, that's literally the end of the world. And this is one of the primary problems with the capitalist system. There are 
clear issues, shortages and deficits which require funding from an entity like a government or corporation, and yet capitalism does not incentivize altruism or working towards making society a little more welcoming or life a little easier for the average person. The average person is good for only two things under a capitalist system, providing cheap labour and consuming their products, on continuing to vote in their people like turkeys voting for Christmas of course, which is surprisingly easy to do when you control the media and can manipulate how information is framed or even what information is provided. Millions of people think that that terrible photoshop job of Diane Abbott wearing odd shoes is real and that Jeremy Corbyn, a lifelong anti-racist activist, is anti-semitic, whilst Boris Johnson, the world's most bigoted man, who once wrote a book accusing the Jews of owning and running the media and economy, is definitely not any of the various flavours of bigot he's been proven to be and absolutely not an anti-semite. The last even vaguely left-wing leader to win in the UK in the past 50 years was the one who was so close with the guy who owns almost all of our popular media outlets that he became godfather to his daughter and also wasn't even all that left-wing. Also, there is one city in the UK that eschews Murdoch's news empire out of protest against the historical tragedy that said empire blamed on the victims and, surprise surprise, they overwhelmingly vote against the wishes of the media barons. Parties and leaders which promise to increase funding for public services and things which would actually benefit society are heavily opposed by those with the power to stop them and as a result rarely if ever win. Under capitalism, if it doesn't provide some benefit to a capitalist, work towards a better world or more just society just doesn't happen. And that's the profit motive folks, inherently harmful, unbelievably powerful and completely unavoidable. You might be able to convince the capitalist that doing something good might be good PR for them, which is why so many billionaires give tiny percentages of their wealth to charity, but that's no real solution. When there are individual people alive today who hold enough personal wealth to end world hunger basically immediately, should they so choose. <laughs> Capitalism sort of requires infinite growth. If a CEO or board of directors is unable to provide constant proof of increasing returns, that's definitely considered a huge failure on their part. Often, what a corporation will do in order to falsely maximise their profits while keeping income the exact same is to do some shady shit like stock manipulation or actually just laying off a ton of employees to make it look like the company is still registering exponential growth even when it's not. The problem is that this means that work doesn't prioritise long-term life improvement but short-term profits. And keeping the CEO's job intact whilst the rank and file workers can just go fuck themselves or maybe get laid off so the company can say hey look our profit margins just went up when in actual fact what happened was the outgoings went down temporarily due to not having to pay as many salaries. Jim Sterling is a beautiful man and is excellent at pointing out and critiquing these sorts of practices specifically as it relates to the video game industry. I have yet to understand why I enjoy Jim's content as much as I do other than staring at his wonderful beautiful face which I want to kiss considering my distinct lack of interest in video video games. Maybe I'm just obsessed with critiques of the capitalist system that I consume all anti-capitalist content without thinking about it. And as for Bobby Kotick, he'd really rather none of you think about politics because you might look at him and start to question his own behaviours and status in the world. If you're not thinking about politics, you're not thinking about the fact that Bobby Kotick was recently criticised for pocketing $180.8 million thanks to what amounts to legalised insider trading. This was thanks to the announcement of a buyback program, which is when a company purchases its own shares. When a company announces a buyback, it's generally an indicator of the business doing well. After all, it has the money to buy its own shares back, it must be pretty damn successful. As a result of this, the company's perceived value shoots way up and share prices shoot up with it. Basically, if a company announces a buyback, its shares become more valuable. And when shares become more valuable, a CEO like Bobby Kotick can make hundreds of millions of dollars by selling theirs. Which is what Kotick did. No less than a day after Activision announced its buyback initiative, Kotick sold almost 4 million shares to the tune of just over $180 million. As a recent report notes, the buyback was announced on February 7th, 2017, and within 10 days, five high-ranking Activision employees had sold over $430 million worth of shares. Most curiously, despite the announcement of a buyback, 
Activision allegedly did not buy back any of its shares. The 2017 buyback echoed the 2015 buyback where, again, Activision didn't repurchase its shares. It's a controversial practice, but Activision is adamant nothing improper took place, and by the letter of the law, it's perfectly legal for this form of trading to take place. Bobby Kotick did nothing wrong on paper. Which is how a lot of capitalism works, doing nothing wrong on paper. Oh, speaking of layoffs, heaven forfend we remember those 800 job losses at the beginning of the year. At the same time as Bobby Kotick boasted of record revenue, the company laid off hundreds of people after keeping them in the dark and worried about their job security for fucking months. Do you recall that? I fucking do. I've not forgotten it. Probably for the best that I remember it and you don't though. Because if you think too deeply about it, you might be tempted to question an economic system where companies routinely jettison hundreds of workers, regardless of those companies' performances because it's a quick and very short-term cost-cutting solution that is supposed to be seen as a business failure, but these days has become a regular industry standard practice. Kotick would hate for you to think too deeply about the job cuts because you might think about the fact that corporations are expected to have infinite growth, something that is literally fucking impossible, and this unachievable aim of perpetually expanding money making leads to routine layoffs as publishers try to outrun the inevitable grasp of reality. And that's rather a significant issue because, of course, we live in a world with finite resources, so the concept of eternal growth is a delusional fantasy. You can't have infinite growth in a world of finite resources, and yet here we are. The thing is, it doesn't have to be this way. Take worker co-ops, for example, the more egalitarian socialist alternative to private businesses. They perform many of the same functions, but at the end of the day, the money made after expenses like maintenance, upkeep, etc. is not funneled upwards to a board of directors or boss or shareholders, but shared equally amongst the workers. In a purely moral economic system, profit would not exist, and therefore neither would this obsession with growth. There are shit alternatives and middle ground compromises to this, like member co-ops, like the co-op supermarket in the UK which, whilst better and in morally better standing than, for example, Tesco's, still don't pay above average wages to employees and, crucially, puts the majority of the power in the hands of the customers, not the workers. Which means that you as a worker still do not have full control over your workplace. Or building societies, which basically exist as member-owned banks and are, in theory, supposed to put all profits earned back into the company and not be concerned with profits, and therefore be more equal. But the one I worked at for about a year somehow managed to pay the CEO tens of millions of pounds, I mean just over £16,000 each year, so not sure how that works. <laughs> It would be difficult to talk about capitalism and how it relates to work without bringing the means of production up. Welcome to Marxism 101, I suppose. Marx's theory of alienation describes the estrangement of people from aspects of their lives and freedoms as a consequence of living in a society of stratified social classes. The alienation from the self is a consequence of being a mechanistic part of a social class, the condition of which estranges a person from their humanity. The theoretical basis of alienation within the capitalist mode of production is that the worker invariably loses the ability to determine life and destiny when deprived deprived of the right to think, conceive of themselves as director of their own actions, to determine the character of said actions, to define relationships with other people, and to own those items of value from goods and services produced by their own labour. Although the worker is an autonomous, self-realised human being, as an economic entity, this worker is directed to goals and diverted to activities that are dictated by the bourgeoisie, who own the means of production, in order to extract from the worker the maximum amount of surplus value in the course of business competition among industrialists. So, to put it bluntly, the current economic system causes the workers to become insular and depressed, acts as a sort of prison, a way of controlling people, and since most people spend around 40 hours a week basically doing something from which they get little to no benefit, and often poverty wages, this system works as a self-perpetuating cycle. You feel worthless, partly because of the constant propaganda telling you that you're fat, ugly, disgusting, and worthless from shop windows and TV screens, but also because all you are is a cog in an unthinking, unfeeling machine, and you never see any of the actual benefits of your work or have any degree of control or impact over
over the product of your labour. Further, as I mentioned in my call centres video, many employers will gaslight you, isolate you, enforce strict hierarchies, constantly make you feel insecure and safe and then reward you for loyalty to your abuser. And employers have such power over their employees that they're now about to get away with installing toilets that punish them for taking too long of a shit. Which I mean, if you're an IBS sufferer or disabled person, fuck you I guess. If your life is dominated by a combination of work, recovering from work and preparing to return to work, well it's hardly freedom now is it? And this is often not even recognised or acknowledged by those suffering from it the most. Now I'm going to tell you a story about someone I know. I'm not going to tell you how I know this person or anything at all about them really, because it's not relevant. What is relevant is their story. So this person, let's call them Big Dave because everyone in the UK knows at least one person called Big Dave, it's the rules, worked in a single office in a small company for around 30 years, most of his working life. He poured his blood, sweat and tears into the job, worked his way up the ladder, sacrificing evenings and weekends for the opportunity to provide a better life for his family. I think he has a few kids and his wife is a stay at home mum, so he's doing pretty well for himself. He becomes one of the directors of this small company, but then one day something happens. Big Dave has an accident. He can't work anymore, at least in order to work he'd need support. He goes to an occupational health specialist because the company refuses to refer him to one, which is illegal, but small companies often get away with breaking employment law, which is why I often hate when people glorify small business owners as if they're not dodgy as fuck, and produces paperwork demonstrating that whilst he is disabled, with a couple of minor tweaks to his workspace, he can continue working. He presents that to his fellow directors who turn on him and make his life as miserable as possible, bring him into a meeting where they verbally abuse him, ignore his disability, call him ableist slurs, and for weeks afterwards make his life as miserable as fucking possible through workplace bullying, until he has no choice but to quit, leaving behind the job into which he poured a majority of his life. And for what? All that time, all that effort, all those weekends and evenings he couldn't or didn't spend with his kids or his wife, all the stress he put himself under for decades and now it's just gone, because he dared to exist with a disability. After all the money he'd made for the company, after being instrumental in building it up from basically nothing in the 80s, he's forced out because he's no longer convenient or useful in the eyes of the other directors and shareholders. I spoke to Big Dave a few weeks after this happened and you know what he told me? He had a pretty decent life, he paid off his mortgage, had a pretty nice lifestyle for most of his youth, but now he wasn't at work anymore. All of that pressure, stress and mental strain he'd had to endure for decades was just gone, and he could look at his life with new eyes and see that it was bullshit. Now all that had been lifted, he could realise that he'd been lied to. He'd thrown away decades of his life for people and entities that didn't give two shits about him and now, now that he was outside the system, he realised the lie he'd been fed and the unnecessary stress and anxiety and struggle he'd endured as a result. And I could relate to this. I'm also disabled, struggle a lot with stuff and require changes to my workspace. I made a video about my particular disability in the past incidentally, but I've had multiple jobs where as soon as it becomes clear that my disability would force me to struggle and they might have to pay money to actually make amendments to my workspace. I suddenly started being called into meetings and interrogations, having the legitimacy of my disability called into question and being accused of wanting special treatment. And of course, when my performance or attendance starts to slip due to constant badgering abuse and extremely slow progress at implementing the changes to my workspace that I require in order to be able to carry out my job that they legally had to, well, that gave them all the excuse they needed to try and push me out, put me on a performance improvement plan, even though the one thing that would improve my performance is one, them backing the fuck off, and two, them actually carrying out their legal responsibility. And of course that was all the excuse they needed to try and push me out, to make my life as miserable as fucking possible because I was disabled and that was inconvenient to them. And this wasn't just one company by the way, some were worse than others, but this was every single place I have ever worked at. And at the end of all this, there's the scourge of hierarchy. The corporation probably doesn't give a fuck about you, but dare to cause even a minor inconvenience to your line manager and they absolutely will make your life a living fucking hell. One of the worst things capitalism does is give petty people a tiny amount of power in order to give them a false sense of investment in the system, even if they're being just as exploited as those over whom they hold authority, the petty bourgeois as they're so called. We see examples of these people all throughout history. Obviously these are more exaggerated examples, but I think it helps to make the point. There were black slave owners, black slave drivers. I brought this up in my video about the legacy of European colonialism, but often in places like the Belgian 
Belgian Congo, the people driving the workers to maximise their output wasn't always the European people, it was the workers they had elevated to an extremely minor position of authority over the others, and they then used that authority as a weapon. Likewise, the colonisers were able to threaten these slave drivers with being made back into ordinary workers, ordinary slaves, if they didn't capitulate to their demands. All this just in order to give them a false sense of investment in the system, even if they're being just as exploited as those over whom they hold authority. In my last job, my manager was ultimately the one who imposed the repressive rules, dragged his feet trying to get my disability requirements in place and did everything possible to make my existence difficult. He also had issues with the company. He couldn't get enough time off to be with his sick kid in hospital because the company wouldn't let him take so much time off. So why did he bother trying to make my life difficult? He knew I had problems with the company and he also knew that I was involved with a union. Because once you have it, the tiniest amount of power the bosses let you have is more important than the solidarity with fellow workers or trying to improve the system in any way. After all, if the system is illegitimate and unfair, does that mean that the recognition that the company gave you is unjust and undeserved? <laughs> One of the most controversial and even subversive suggestions the UK Labour Party made this past election, which was picked up by the right-wing media personalities and memed to death without a second's worth of honest critique, was the idea of a four-day week as opposed to the current standard five-day one. The idea, though it was never acknowledged by the Conservatives and capitalists, was actually built on pretty sound logic as jobs become obsolete and are replaced by automation and productivity skyrockets whilst wages stagnate. Realistically, it would make sense to reduce working hours in order to stop mass in employment and riots that will probably come in the next few years if things continue the way they are. I have many, many problems with the work of CGP Grey, but he was not wrong about that. This is widely considered a utopian dream by many people, but let's actually examine it for a moment. For one thing, let's just get this out of the way. Four day weeks, they work. Microsoft Japan, for example, gave a four day work week a trial run in August 2019, and this resulted in a 40% increase in productivity and multiple fringe benefits like more productive meetings and so on. It turns out, the less men mentally drained and physically exhausted your workforce is, the more productive and able to carry out their job at peak productivity they might be. Likewise, for the same reasons, part-time workers are demonstrably more efficient and productive than their full-time counterparts. If you're only in work for a few hours a day, you have less to worry about, don't get as exhausted, and don't have to endure the 9 to 5 grind. But whilst they may be provably beneficial, there's more to it than that. See, as we've brought up before on this channel, conservatives and right-wingers don't actually seem to care about facts. No, most conservative arguments are arguments from feelings, and this is no different. The workers don't deserve the time off, the argument goes. Besides, think about the poor companies. How will they cope? They might only make $95 billion. As wages have stagnated, corporate profits and productivity have skyrocketed. Here, incidentally, is that graph I brought up a second ago. It's a graph of corporate productivity measured against the average wages. Notice that the main point of diversity Convergence here is approximately the same time period as the unions lost a lot of their power in the West. Interesting that. Anyway, it's clear that as productivity skyrockets and more goods are produced for less necessary effort, well, surely it stands to reason that, as usually, work is required to sustain productivity, the less work required to provide for everyone, the more time off workers can have. After all, if a new machine is invented that does half my job for me, I should just be able to take half my days off, right? Oh, my sweet summer child. This isn't about truth or facts or fairness, it's about ideology and the warped philosophy of capitalism. You see, as I mentioned, capitalism is not a fair negotiation between worker and employer, but a constant battle between the bosses who want to implement a feudal system of wage slavery and the workers who want freedom. Or at least that's how it should logically be, but as I said, indoctrination plays a huge part here. The right-wing media will happily tell the working people that they don't deserve more time off, that this would be disastrous and ruin the economy and so on, but in places with stronger unions and a more established sense of class consciousness, this is already the case. France, for example, reduced maximum working hours to 13 hours a week less than we in the UK have. It's 35 hours in France, incidentally, that's the maximum amount of hours worked per week. In the UK, it's 48 hours, and I've worked for a lot of companies that specifically set out in their contracts that you have to opt out of that maximum working time in order to take the job. A while ago, and reports suggest that a four-day work week is the next logical step. Step. And does France have a problem with productivity? Well, it's still one of the world's leading economies, so I would suggest 
Probably not. I feel like we often forget that similar arguments were made about the eight hour work day, which we now take for granted, and the same truths were evident then. A worker working eight hours is more productive than a worker working 12, and it's not like it'll severely affect the company's profits anyway. But the key part in that battle was one key factor that I think is missing in this current discussion. Work-life balance. The last eight hours on that old poster is labelled eight hours for what we will, and I think that's important. Take a moment to step back, try and shake off any ideology you may be clinging onto, and ask yourself this, without talking about capitalism or meritocracy or any bullshit like that, why should your boss take 5 out of 7 days of your week? The boss's profits are up drastically from 50 years ago and yet you're still doing the same amount of work for the same money as workers 50 years ago were. Whilst the boss's gold continues to pile up, you don't owe the boss shit. Why should they take your time and not give you any of the extra proceeds? And further, why do we live in a society where it's acceptable to live a majority of your life in yoke to an elite class of monsters? Quite frankly, I think four days is too generous. Just take a look at this graph again. Your boss's productivity is 130% higher than it was 50 years ago, and your average wage and working hours have remained stagnant. If productivity is doubled, then working hours should be halved. We already produce more than enough goods and resources to provide a comfortable life for everyone on the planet. It's not an issue of production, it's an issue of distribution. Why do we need all that extra productivity anyway? Two and a half days. Maybe three if I'm feeling generous. That's all you should get, fucker. And bonus, I'll actually be more productive during that time, so you actually win here. That doesn't... Oh, shit. It will never cease to astonish and actually kind of scare me the amount of people who I've come across in my working life who'll go to bat for the bosses and will say shit like, yeah, but it could be worse. I mean, I've had worse jobs than this. Or some shit like, yeah, no shit, it could be worse, but it could also be better. Losing an arm is worse than losing a finger, but I don't think you're going to be all that willing to let me chop your fucking finger off for no reason, are you? We've been conditioned into believing that sacrificing 40 hours of our week to a group of unempathetic, inhuman monsters with no concept of empathy, fairness, or justice this is okay. We've reached a point where we can justify giving decades of our lives, including a majority of our youth, to make someone else rich whilst we struggle to survive. And some of us have even been indoctrinated into believing that we don't deserve better. Yeah, let's vote for the people who want to raise the retirement age to 75, three years before I'm statistically going to die anyway. It's not like I deserve time off in my old age. The boss just works harder, that's why he doesn't pay me enough to survive whilst he buys his fifth luxury yacht. I can't work less hours. Think how that might affect the company. It's okay that my job makes me unnecessarily unhappy. I can get fucking bladdered on Friday night anyway. It's not weird or a sad indictment of our society that I necessarily require obscene amounts of chemicals and alcohol in order to deal with my miserable existence under a capitalist system. It doesn't matter that my wage isn't good enough to get by, I can do a bunch of overtime to make up for it. I might not get to spend much time with my family anymore, and yes I am dedicating even my time off to the company, but it just shows how willing I am to make sacrifices for the good of the company, and hey in a few years time I might even become a manager, and then all you other workers better watch the fuck out. Capitalism ruined your work life, but we can stop it. Join the union and fight back. Take back what's rightfully yours. And if you don't want to do that, well, first of all, fuck off. But also, get out of the way of people who do. And most of all... Stop it. Get some help. Is it water with the sheep in the... in the box? Hello everyone. What'd you think of that then? I quite liked that video. Anyway, you probably know why we're here by now, so... Let's just get into it. I want to thank an incredible amount, the people who are on screen right now, who are all the people who give me money each month on Patreon, which is just truly amazing, and thank you to all those people you actually helped me to survive and to buy food, which is, I'm very grateful for, honestly. But I especially want to thank Corvus. Next we have Ryan, uh, Brian, it's Brian. Stacy Solano, Susie M, Thomas McCallum, and Tom Newport. 